Welcome back. Um, you know, as a sometime lecturer at the iSchool, I've learned one of the pleasures of being an academic is that you really can torture people with total license, your students. And the way I do it, you know, everybody's got their own style, but the way I do it is I'll, I'll ask the students in my first lecture of the year to turn off all their devices and just listen to me for 45 minutes. And you ought to see the way people squirm when they're not online, or you know, they, they can't hit that phone to see if there might be something more important than listening to me, which there probably is, but they can't do it. You know, and the, the point of that is to let the information sort of pass through them and percolate for a while before they you know, go check something else. But it's also for the experience firsthand of seeing how radically the mindset of people has changed. That kind of urgency about new information what, that was latent becomes manifest as we carry these devices. And that's a very vivid slice of something that's much more widespread, which is the change in mindset caused by new technology that is pervasive and powerful. Now, this has happened before, and typically when it is powerful, it plays on your identity, your sense of self. And this has to do with the age-old dichotomy of what makes up identity. How do you see the world, and how does the world see you, and how do you resolve that kind of tension that's ongoing? In the case of new technologies, this is typically a kind of internal experience of writing blogs or communicating outward or digesting what people are saying about you and the external experience of being tagged and watched and having people look at you and refer to you or tell you other things you might like and being seen that way and getting messages that are highly personal but also manufactured from other people that are all going into your sense of who you are in the world and how dynamic your life has become. This kind of urgency about self is a very uh, highly tweaked element of our new life. Now, I say all this as a way of introducing Andreas Vegan, who's going to speak about the art of social data, because he has been thinking about and working in the meaning of social data and the effect of social data on the consumer mindset and broadly on the human mindset for some years, uh, originally as chief scientist at Amazon, a lecturer at Stanford, the most peripatetic man I have ever met. You're frequently in a country for two weeks and then in six other time zones for two other weeks. And he's landed in Cal today to speak about the art of social data and a few hard rules he has discovered around how best to work with this. So with no further ado, Andreas. Quentin, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to be here. And I want to start with us reflecting. It's been eight years since Facebook started. How Facebook has changed the way a billion people think about who they are. How Amazon.com has changed the way a billion people buy things. And of course, how Google has changed the way a billion people think about information. So that in just a few years, in what Jeff Bezos would call a blip in history. My goal, whether it's my goal in teaching, my goal when I was at Amazon or when I worked with companies, is to help people make better decisions based on data. So I want to first start here thanking Anno for inviting me to give a talk here and for also telling you the four things I'm going to do, which happen to be the four, same four ingredients at what I'll do this fall in the course, which we call the Social Data Revolution in the School of Information. First, I'll tell you what actually social data is. Second, I will talk about the four C's of social data. Third, I will talk about identity. And fourth, I will talk about monetization. I hope we'll have some time for questions. And if something is urgent, do interrupt me in the middle. I think I have enough flux, enough 
chance to actually adjust things so they're the right thing for you. And I'll then summarize everything in the eight rules for social data. My perspective is that of consumers, of end users, of individuals. So what we have seen is a dramatic shift. Shift what I call the social data revolution enabled by technology, but also the technology is then driven by a billion people using it. So I'm interested in that cycle. And specifically here, I'm interested in how this irreversible mindset shift has happened in what we do, how we relate. I mean, Facebook, think about how relationships are shifted, how our very notion of what a friend is has changed, and ultimately about who we are. I want to contrast my view with some of the things which you have heard yesterday in the morning today. Think about this amazing company called Path Intelligence, Bryce talked about. To remind you, your mobile phone emits all the time where you are because otherwise how could your friends reach you? And they just sniff that digital exhaust. And based on that, help, for instance, stores understand how consumers move around. There's a company in Palo Alto called Euclid Systems, which does the same for smartphones only by looking at the MAC address your phone emits. So in most cases like those, it is that the store owner can do experiments, just as we know it from the online world, but the consumer doesn't really do much here. In contrast, I want to talk here about the data individuals create and share how that has changed and how that is changing. In my perspective, how that really is pretty much the only exponential technology which we have right now. So it is not only that individuals do this among individuals, peer to peer, but of course it also applies to them as the organizations. It has a huge effect, looking at Eric here, on the future of work, reputation, social capital, but I'm going to focus now on data. All right, so here's an example. This, I didn't do much besides pushing a button and allowing Google, Google Latitude to be precise, to collect those data. And what you see from there, each of these dots actually has a time step. I live in San Francisco. I teach at Stanford, and sometimes it's 280, sometimes it's 101, hope springs eternal. And, <laughs> and then every now and then, free lunch at Google, free lunch at Facebook, I have friends there who sort of treat me there. And then they call it enemy territory, but maybe I should flip it from here. I sometimes come out here and um, at Berkeley. I don't really do anything actively to this besides giving Google permission, and they actually do an amazing job. For instance, when I do a search, it of course is more relevant for me if I see the research results related to where I am, if I use maps, if I use navigation. So all of these things coming together to this fine density of every single location I visit. Two weeks ago, I had dinner with a friend of Terry O'Dean's, Danny Kahneman. And I showed Danny that it even picked up when I got up in the morning. And that, Danny thought, that actually makes him uncomfortable, which I think is interesting. That notion that I move from my bedroom to the kitchen to make some coffee gets, gets picked up in the very fine granularity by moving you know, from one Wi-Fi spot to another Wi-Fi spot by Google Attitude. Now, I choose to actually socialize those data. If you go to weigen.com, you find on weigen.com slash itinerary precisely my location, probably within three meters right now, knowing that I'm on stage. And not only this, I also have future data, which are socialized there, namely the next flights I'm taking, etc. And people always say, oh my God, isn't that a security risk? And I always say, well, you know, if somebody wants to break into my house, please rather do it when I'm not there. That's dramatic. <laughs> So we create in a social way local data often through the mobile. And if you think about it, the mobile for many people 
is really the best proxy for the person. After all, what do you touch more often than your mobile phone? <laughs> it also allows for easy interactions, lightweight interactions. So, so much for create. Now, the real innovation is no longer the creation. Yes, sure, there are more sensors in the world than people. But the real innovation, which we've seen in the last years, valued at about $100 billion, which is about $100 per user, is distribution, social distribution. And the real insight Mark had is that what those of you who started off as engineers, learning that the purpose of communication is to transmit information, actually weren't quite right. It's much more that information is an excuse for communication. That's for a school of information a pretty important thing to think about. So we talked about the creation, the distribution, and the consumption, and particularly for consumption, of course, geolocation is an important element. Now, I hope that this introduction made the difference between social data and social media. Some of you I know work in social media here. Uh, made it clear that it's not about publishing media about yourself, but if we will, it's about the underlying, underlying layer, the deeper layer of the data we create and share. Both the data like geolocation and also the data about connections between people, the social graph. Now, if I thought, if I once I thought about how would I structure this, I want to offer you here in part two of the talk the framework of the four C's. The first, is what I showed you already, is content. And we clearly can relate this back to Google. The fact, as I said, a billion people think differently about content from the way they thought about it 20 years ago. Second one is context. That phone ringing in the background. If it only knew that its owner was sitting here in a talk in the lecture hall. And it's sort of embarrassing now for you to even reach in the bag. I, know. <laughs> I actually have a little device I bought in Hong Kong, which has a little switch. And when I flip that on, it sort of scrambles the mobile space. So if I really get annoyed in class, this little flip, everybody tries for a couple of minutes where they can still text, and then they put their phones away and thought something is like so context comes in a number of flavors. There is the socio context, the social context, who we are connected, like who was that person who actually was giving you a call. But then, of course, there is the context of the geolocation where you are and the context about that in this room right now, it's mainly me speaking and you giving me your attention. The next C is the C of connection. So we have content context, needing sensors, etc., helping us you know, digest the content. Connection, meaning for me, the connection with two people. I don't mean sort of a deep psychological connection, but just simply this asymmetrical thing that you know we might be connected, or we are connected via Dave Romer Hart, which would be the indirect connections. And then finally, I think the last C is in this customer-centric view is that of conversation. So when I work with companies, we all sort of check which of those four Cs are present in the product. And it turns out that if the product actually allows for people to connect and allows actually for richer conversations, this product is much more likely to be successful than if one of the four Cs is missing. Two, Thousand, I think, when the Q-Train manifesto came out, Doc Searles, Dave Weinberg, and the others said, markets are conversations. I think we have reached a stage where conversations have become markets. In the following sense, that you and your friend are having a conversation, say, via email. Gmail helps you actually to make a market out of that. Or you're talking, you're commenting on somebody's post on Facebook. Facebook allows you to actually make a marketplace of that. 
Now, these are local markets. These are no longer global markets. And the implications of that onto uh, reputation, social capital, something I'm very interested in, onto the future of work are huge. But before we go into the future, I will going to go back into the dark ages, into the past, and talk about the third part of my talk, identity. Specifically, the dark ages of the Stasi in East Germany. This year is the cover sheet of the folder the Stasi had about me. And still, until 89, they carefully updated my whereabouts. In a world where the only exponential technology is data, that was clearly not tenable. And for me, I think one of the main reasons that you know, Eastern Bloc actually collapsed was that that notion that they wanted to control the information simply was not possible if you have an exponential number of people of the population, exponential number of people who actually would be in charge of observing what the rest of the people are doing. So the Stasi had about a quarter million people working for them at the end of East Germany. What were the 80s? Then the 90s, you know that, that cartoon from the New Yorker. On the internet, nobody knows your dog. Slight change. In 2012, on the internet, everybody knows your dog. So what we are seeing with social data is a shift in identity. In the past, our identity was given through attributes. German guy, blue eyes, etc. And that often is good enough, and many governments still operate that way. Like, I was in Shanghai, that's where I met Anno actually, and uh, you know, visa and my passport. And you know, for the Chinese, we white guys all look the same. So pay attributes, somebody between 30 and 60, done. On the other hand, if they looked at my relationships, if they grabbed my Facebook, my ID, my password, within, I think, a few interactions, my friends would know that it isn't me. My Twitter account was hacked, and I think within like five tweets, within our lapse time, I got a couple of calls from people saying, hey, Andreas, just to let you know, you need to change your Twitter password. So Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn, deeply thinks about identity and makes the point that it's not only who you know, but it's who they know. That, again, in this future of work world we live in, it truly is about the connections and the understanding, the social capital, who we can hit up for something, which actually makes a difference. Now, I want to give a simple example here for marketing. And I taught at Haas maybe four years ago, three years ago, a course on marketing in Web 2.0, where we had a whole semester digging in, trying to understand how can we use social data in the marketing department. And one of the examples I use is here from AT&T, where they had a new phone product and try to figure out how to market this. Now you know that AT&T, Bell Labs, is where the best statisticians in the world hang out. So we really know that those guys know their work. So they did segmentation, traditional segmentation, based on demographics, psychographics, loyalty data, etc. And a former colleague of mine at NYU said, let's just compare this to something super simple namely to the social graph, i.e. to the connections between people, who calls whom. So if Terry calls me and I buy a product, AT&T suggests to him that might be an interesting product for you or increases the probability of suggesting it to him. Remember old palm phone? <laughs> so now the question is, how do these things work? And in this comparison, it was done in a very clean way what do you think which of the two works better? Well, 
let's think about it. If it was segmentation, would I show you that slide? Of course not. So the only question is how much better does it work? And it's about a factor of five in adoption rate. So what we have seen before, those four C's, which also are the essence of what Amazon's Share the Love used to be. And just to recap, it is the content that is the book, for instance, I bought. It is the context, the fact that I bought that book. It is leveraging connection by Amazon asking me whether there's any friend who I might have who might want to get a note that I bought that book, get 10% discount, and I get 10% credit. And then finally, it is an excuse for conversation. So those four C's show up just as well here in this marketing example. Now, that's an old example. What I want to talk about in the last part here of monetization is what new business models are emerging based on social data. We all here know Craig Newmark. And uh, see him actually next week at the Economist conference. And the strength of Craig's list is, some people would say, anonymity. For instance, I was in Vegas last week, and I've heard that the pimps control their prostitutes with their SIM cards. And beyond that, you can call me Clara or Juanita or whatever it is. Now, that is Craigslist, built in the 90s. Here are three examples, and I just started in the alphabet, of social business models, of business models that use social data. The first one is Airbnb, San Francisco-based. The idea is that if I have a spare bedroom, which I'm willing to rent out to act as a host, and somebody else visits San Francisco and is interested in you know, renting a room from somebody, rather than anonymizing it as hotels do that, they claim that they know you, but whoever you know believes that I think is a fool. Um, rather than anonymizing it, Airbnb embraces the social data people create. So it says, well, Andreas Weigand has this room. That's him. And this is his Facebook profile. This is even if he wants to create more, his profile on Airbnb. And those are people who stayed with him in the past. Transparency. For me, too. It is not just some random person showing up, but that person, I can look at their profile and I can get a much better feeling about, well, do I want them around my house for a couple of days? That is pretty radical. It was not possible before. For my course, what I plan to do in the fall, unless it's you know, illegal at Berkeley, is I was going to ask the students who apply for the course to give me access symmetrically to their Facebook. Because I'm actually curious, what are the reasons why they want to take that course? And it tells me so much more if they just have you know, lots of famous people in their collection of friends. It's very different. These are the people to ask, typically. It's very different for somebody being genuinely interested in what this revolution is about. And that's much more meaningful than having them write a couple of pages of an essay. Astrid. Who has done Astrid? Astrid is a startup in San Francisco. It's one of the many social to-do list startups. So let's say, the usual example from TaskRabbit and the API via TaskRabbit, I want somebody to pick up my suit. Then I just say, pick up suit. They socialize my task. And then somebody shows up and says, OK, I'm going to take it three bucks and deliver the suit to Andreas. Now, that is the element of just socializing my tasks. Now, let's say it's not my suit which I want to have picked up from the cleaners, but it's my kid who I want to have to picked up from the cleaners, or rather from the kindergarten, say. <laughs> and then it might be more interesting whether there is something I know about that person. What, you know, can I trust them? Can I actually really do I want to have that person pick up my kid? And vice versa. Do they actually want to maybe have a conversation with me every now and then in exchange to actually being able to, you know, picking up the kid as opposed to picking up somebody else's kid at another cleaners or kindergarten? And the third example here is after the future of where we sleep, 
after the future of who does tasks for us, branch out the future about how we work. I have two teams at Stanford working with branch out. Branch out has, I don't know the exact numbers right now, between 10 and 20 million people using that app on Facebook. What it does, it is an app that helps basically recruiters find people who might be in the market for getting a job. We are friends because when you accept the app, you give branch out access to your friends. Branch out sees about half a billion people's profiles, more than we have people in the United States. Now, the profiles are not super good. I mean, for instance, I have a super lousy profile there about what I do and what I'm interested in. But by understanding the social graph, we can, indif we can infer that you know, if he's a professor and she's a professor and he's a professor and one of them has these skills, the other one has those skills, we can sort of have a probabilistic model and help that recruiter then figure out whether that professor or that developer at Google is somebody who should be going after. So all I want to say here is that in these three examples of where we sleep, we of, of course have who we sleep with in dating sites, which is a pretty obvious one, where we sleep, uh, what tasks we have done, and uh, what we are doing for other people. In these three examples, we see that social business models make a big difference. So it's not just about talking about the stuff. What I typically do is work with companies and uh, these questions like imagine you had all the data of the world. What would you do to delight your customers? Um, I would be happy to give people, if people have time afterwards, some examples ranging from Sony last month to the American Express, where people really came up with amazing new products based on social data. Another example here is a few questions on social data intelligence, the social data lab at Stanford developed where we have a bunch of questions helping companies understand of what they can do to do better. But this here is not a consulting gig. I want to close this instead by my eight rules for social data. So this here is my last slide. Rule number one, collect everything. Rule number two, give data to get data. It is actually in many reasons why that's a good rule. Um, I gave a talk at a company called Early Warning Systems, which has data from all the banks to basically know that when you're showing up at this AT&T machine, somebody else might have already shown up at another at and machine with your card, and there might be a problem. And they give data to get data. Or they ping your phone as your credit card not present seems to be as an address in Russia. And if your phone is in the United States, that is not good for getting that credit card transaction accepted. Third point is, and that is something which is very close. Michael, we talked about that yesterday, the point starting with the problem, not with the data. So see the tack here, collect everything, give data to get data, but then what's the problem you're trying to solve? And so many companies, this analysis paralysis, who don't actually think about number three by saying, oh, now we've got all the data, there must be some value in there, there must be a pony in there. Um, all these companies, they don't get anywhere because they're not clear what the problem is. The problem might shift by starting with the problem and then iterating and not just with the data. Fourth one is very deeply uh, me that we want to focus on metrics that matter to the individual customers. Example from Amazon is the call center. When you call, traditionally each call is in some balance sheet, whatever, 10 bucks for the company. Not so at Amazon. If you call and have your problem resolved, it's actually a good thing for Amazon because you'll tell people, wow, they actually have phones there and they, I asked to have my you know, iPad shipped. They said, oh, so sorry, they shipped me two instead. Amazing. But if you have to call a second time for the same thing, then the cost is way more than two times $10 because at that stage, you're pissed off. So 
putting these things into equations that embody, that embody, embrace really the word from the customer perspective is so important. Another example is uh, shipment, for instance. I worked in January with a company in Germany uh, which does mainly um, distance retail. And uh, asked a simple question, Christmas last year, um, Germany, Christmas is like you have the 4th of July where you grill, Germans have Christmas Day where they have Christmas trees, and under the Christmas trees there tend to be presents, and asked, so how many of the people you promised that they would ship it by the 24th actually you know, got it by the 24th? It turned out 37%. So I was not surprised about this huge social media problem they had. Think about it, 60 something percent of Germans, Christmas trees, empty. So that is a custom perspective as opposed to having it from a company perspective and tell you the average ship rate of things. Five, drop irrelevant constraints. I think the older I get, the more I realize just how smart the people were before us. And they did an amazing job in engineering around the constraints their times had. Now, in the last half hour, this talk about social data, what I want to get clear to you is that many of these constraints we used to have, we don't have anymore. So dropping constraints that are no more relevant is, I think, very, very important in strategy discussions to realize. Six is embracing transparency, symmetry, building business models that actually make money because of symmetry and not because of asymmetry. The seventh one is Jeff Bezos' point. He always says to make it trivially easy for people to contribute, think reviews. I would like to add, to connect, to collaborate. And then the last one is here. Let people do what people are good at and computers what computers are good at. That's what I wanted to share with you. Um, there is a little bit more information here. And when I was thinking about how I can actually um, do a job in helping people understand what decisions they need to make, individuals understand. I realized it's not by writing another paper, but maybe it is by making a film. So I'm working with a couple of people, and this is the question unformulated three weeks ago at the information session, the whole thing started. The question about what is one social data experience that had the greatest impact on your life. So in the couple of talks I had since, I already have 150 responses from people who tell me just amazing things, how their estranged child got back because they reconnected with them on Facebook, or how they found their partner, that's a pretty common one, or how they dumped their partner given some of the pictures they were in, etc. So if somebody has some ideas, wants to talk to me, I'm here for the rest of the day. I now would like to welcome any questions you have, any feedback, whatever you have. But first of all, thank you for your attention. So, Eric. That was terrific, uh, Andreas. Uh, uh, actually, just the very last point you had on your slide, you talked about let um, computers do what they're good at and people do what they're good at. What is that and how is that changing over time? Um, think MTurk, Mechanical Turk, as one of the things I know quite well, where the idea was not to build yet better OCR algorithms, but to use the constraint that had disappeared, namely chopping up work into small pieces and then letting people do, you know, people see patterns whether they're there or not. And so allowing people to do that in an infrastructure, Mechanical Turk, um, is I think the thought we had as opposed to building better algorithms of trying this. Or one of the dating sites uh, I work with, um, they have something uh, called Dick Petrol. So on, uh, 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 on sort of these apps, it's not okay to show certain body parts or things that look like certain body parts. So uh, it's actually not that easy for the computer to figure out whether that is the case. Uh, however, it is pretty easy for people. Although it's very interesting, the social norms and what is appropriate or not, we had to train the people elsewhere in South Asia first to understand what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. 
So that's an example of letting people do what people are good at and letting computers do what computers are good at. <laughs> There's actually another way of saying this, is which is don't blame technology for what's ultimately issues about society, which is social norms, institutional norms, as I learned from Arno. That's another way of saying the last point. Hi, Andreas. Hey. Um, so when are we going to have our own social graph? Because you highlighted three, you know, like Craigslist, and this is like the alphabet. I'm assuming there's like another 26 for each letter of the alphabet, social things. And you know what? I really don't want to log into Facebook to log into those things because, A, I left Facebook. And, B, where's my copy of my graph relative to this particular social context of like, is it going to happen? I think it's going to happen, but do you think it's going to happen? I learned from my roommate, Barney Powell, that there are three things, Andreas, you need to know about people. They are lazy, horny, and greedy. So uh, I think... <laughs> um, I think, Kalia, the fact that people are lazy is what will make it very difficult for people to actually create their own social graph in some other network. I'm, you know, we have had this conversation. I agree with you. It would be awesome. But I think uh, most people just, I mean, seeing Google+, Plus, which hasn't been super successful, they try to, of course, seed it by using, uh, with Google+, Buzz, using your implicit graph. But that's what people were not happy with. I have actually one nice slide here on um, a slide where it says a man and a woman, and uh, the woman says, oh, honey, thank you for the pair of golden earrings. But who got the other one? Because he had socialized via Blippi his purchases. So I don't know. Um, however, what I think is a very, very interesting thing to think about, and I definitely want to spend some time in the fall, and Quentin has some good ideas on this, is when we talk about identity to also talk about what is a group. So I'm working, another of my Stanford teams is working with Meetup. Meetup.com is, I think, like 10 million uh, users or meetups a month. It's, it's a reasonably a big number. And one of the things we found is people come for the benefits and they stay for the community. Uh, that's one of these consistent things. However, whatever experiments were done, this is how the world of groups work. I, uh, there are many questions. Do you fence in? Do you fence out? Uh, do you define the group by the boundary in the first place? My personal view is, and that's just one random dude's view, that what matters is my local social graph. I'm just looking here in this room and seeing, you know, the number of wonderful people who I met in very different contexts. I mean, that's just for me amazing. And for me, it doesn't really matter what institutions they belong to. All of that has disappeared, I think, in the world where the social capital, where identity is something which you create, as opposed to something which gets bestowed upon you by the institution you work for. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. humanizing that, but the real way to put it is not on the internet everybody knows you're a dog. On the internet everybody knows you have dog attributes and dog relationships. They never conclude you're a dog. It was like we were saying with Gil earlier, you know, in this world truth is kind of asymptotic. It's a series of relationships, it's a series of experiences, points of view in relationship that lead to some assumption about a fact or a truth. But this is why I like talking to you, because we come to these philosophical moments, just writing them down as we're going. You know, Truth is now a sum of experiences, relationships, and points of view, but subject to change if new data comes into the mix. And so truth is kind of stated, which also you know, speaks to a kind of age-old dilemma about um, whether the world exists in our own minds or whether we're the product of what the world is saying. And this comes down decisively on we are the product of what the world is doing with our behavior. 
But where do we actually have a delta between, I mean, who of you filters what they say on Facebook? as opposed to just randomly take well, shots. which of your kids do is more the question. We have a fit in both worlds, you know. What does the next generation do? And they tend to act promiscuously. But I need to get a, I need to move us along. <laughs> anyway, the last point I wanted to make was, if you could delight your customers, what would you do? You'd give them their ideal version of themselves. Thank you. They just don't know what that is yet. Yeah, around. I was there, I and was that's because we have to sort through an enormous amount of data nowadays to sort out our needs, our identities, how to manage this, how to manage companies around this. And in this working with large data sets, as DJ was talking about today, we need to manage a lot of this. There are a few variables well, and there are more and more variables coming on, which leads us to our next speaker.